Welcome to Unscripted Faith. I'm Angela Madden. I'm here with Jay Anthony Gilbert. Listen, we know we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And Jesus says, who's our neighbor? The one we show mercy on. I think we're going to get into some of that today. I agree with you. I think a lot of times we've all heard the statement, the people that need the love the most are the ones that we don't feel deserve it. And we've got a phenomenal story, Andrew Brocker's story of overcoming addiction in a near-death experience, which I personally know about. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be outstanding. Yeah, and also today we're going to sit down with a guest that's going to share with us a little bit about how he cares for those who are wounded. Our guest today is actually Dr. Chad Savage. He has a heart for helping others. His primary focus is on the patient and doing what's best for them. He is the founder of Your Choice Direct Care, and he joins us now to discuss the challenges of the current healthcare system and seeks to restore sanctity to the doctor-patient relationship. This is something we all, I think, are very aware of, Jay, that has become an issue within our current healthcare system. And so we are glad to have you, Dr. Chad. Welcome to Unscripted Faith. Hey, Angela. Hey, Pastor. How are you, sir? It's so good to have you, and we are so glad to get right into this with you. And listen, at the end of the day, this is what I want to know. You left a great job. I mean, a cushy job is the word that's being used, <laughs> and left to start your own practice. Mm -hmm. How much of a risk is that for a doctor? Well, you know, when I did it, I did it actually in midlife. So there's more risk doing it then because you design your life around your yeah. expected income. Yeah. And to, to take a practice that was thriving and, and essentially throw it away because you knew that though it financially was well off, it was not fulfilling my calling as a physician, um, did take a little bit of courage at the time. It's actually easier for doctors who are freshly coming out of training because they're kind of used to living on a tighter budget with a resident salary than to do it midlife. But it kind of tells you how bad the situation had become for me to willfully toss away a practice like that and start over in my 40s. Absolutely. You know, I know that for myself personally, whenever I go to the doctor's office, whether it be for myself or my daughters, I am always shocked that some of these healthcare providers are like, get them in, get them out. Yeah, I mean, they're yeah, in your yeah. room. They, they <laughs> diagnose you without barely looking at you and send you on. That's something you're trying to change, correct? Oh, absolutely, because I can assure you, having been one of those doctors in the past, that's not fundamentally how most of them want to practice. You know, they want to give good care. They want to take time with their patients, but the system's not designed to be conducive to that. They're designed in a way where they're pushed by the payment model, the insurance companies and the government, to have five- or ten-minute visits. And we talk about the over-medicalization of our society, that drugs are being tossed at people, you know, far too vigorously without focus on the more time-consuming education that goes along with lifestyle modification and such. And part of it is because of that pressure, that time pressure that the payment model puts on these doctors. So it's easier to run into a room, toss a drug at the person, have them run out the door and then move on to the next patient. Uh, it's much more time consuming to sit down, you know, discuss their current failings and being able to maybe live up to the lifestyle they need to, and then explain if a medication is needed, why it's advantageous. So I knew I had to break away from that model, and I heard about a, uh, a model of medical care that's not a franchise. It's just a general philosophy of practice called direct primary care. And in direct primary care, the goal was to eliminate those third parties, the government and the insurance company, from the sacred relationship of the doctor and the patient so that we could get back to being the true advocates of those patients and actually do so while actually reducing costs. And I'm very, very happy to report that now nine years into this that we've been very successful in doing so. Um, this is not an advertisement for my practice. This is just so people understand the general concept. Between 49 and $89 a month, depending on age, our practice is able to provide unlimited primary care to those patients without any co-pays. We schedule in 30-minute, one-hour blocks. We have same-day accessibility, and we work with their coverage product, whether that be traditional insurance or an alternative called health sharing that's much less expensive, sticks to Christian uh, principles of, of, of sharing each other's burdens, um, and is extremely, though you can use that with a, a normal insurance-based medical practice, is extraordinary, com extraordinarily compatible with the type of practice that I engage in. Well, it sounds like you've kind of shifted away from a payment model to a patient model. So my next question is, my wife, Tiffany, I'm sure she'd like to know when you're coming to Pittsburgh because she's all about the people first. She loves bedside manners, and it sounds like that's what you guys' focus is. So are you coming to Pittsburgh? Uh, 
I am not personally, <laughs> but the, if there is a website called dpcfrontier.com that has a map of, of practices that are similar philosophy to my own, um, there are other ones out there. There's no single program that is totally inclusive because these are all individually owned practices. Um, but I am absolutely certain there are some in the Pittsburgh area and, and people can find those compatible practices um, and then learn about health sharing ministries like Samaritan Ministries, which I'm personally a member of and see if they're a, a good match for their own and their own family's needs. You know, even like you're saying, like Tiffany, you know, whenever I go in, I think it's very common among us women. When we go in, we want to sit down and we want you to look us in the eyes and we want you to understand what we're feeling and what we're sensing. And it, that to me computes to compassion, yeah. you know, and would you, are there statistics that show Dr. Chad that compassion actually brings medicinal healing mm. just in that? Mm. Wow. Oh, absolutely. I can. There, wow. there are absolutely studies that have shown that if you understand your doctor is empathetic and concerning and has your best interest in mind, you are more, more likely to adhere to the recommendations that, that they make. Um, and then just wow. on an experiential basis, I, I can tell you that I, I jokingly refer to it as the healing ear. People will come in frequently and they'll have complaints and they'll start to talk. And at the end of it, they'll say, oh, okay, well, maybe we'll consider this treatment or this other option. And, and they'll go, you know what, doc? No, that's okay. I just needed to get that off my chest. And there's no room for that within the current rushed five-minute governmentally insurance-controlled um, practice of medicine. And in fact, there's no codes for that. So you can't put a code on, I listen to the patient. So you can't bill for it. And, and traditional practices can't even exist essentially on empathy. Um, but empathy is a, is a hallmark of, of what we should be doing as physicians. You look at alternative medical practices and why people love them so much. They don't necessarily have better outcomes. Um, the reason people love them so much is because they, they, they are outside of the traditional payment model and can have empathy. Well, I'm an allopathic physician. I'm a traditional physician. I will do anything that's helpful to the patient, whether that be vitamins, medications, you know, education, or, or what have you. Um, but I, I, because I exist outside of the payment model, I can do what's best for the patient without that outside coercion of the payment system. What was the exact time that you kind of saw that, you know what, I need to get out of this way of the payment model to more of the patient model? Well, yeah, in the 2000s, unfortunately, I'm kind of old. I, I, the pra you know, practice of medicine was already though, slipping. I, I, I could feel it at that time. And, and just to be honest and not to be political, but uh, when ACA Obamacare came into vogue, we warned at that time that they were going to overload the system and bureaucratize the practice of medicine. And we knew that there would be longer wait times and quality care would go down, and we absolutely saw that. And unfortunately, it's, uh, people's memories are short, and I think people are failing to connect the problems we're seeing in healthcare right now to the implementation of that law, but it's absolutely the case. Well, I told my patients when I knew I couldn't give good quality care anymore, I would leave, but unfortunately, I'm human and I'm fearful, and, and um, I got to that point around probably 2012, but it took 2015 for me to get up the nerves and the will to actually separate myself and, and open my own practice. And it, it, was a, it was a scary time, to be flat and honest with you. I thought I could fail. I thought I was going to harm my family. Um, but you know, the Lord is good and, and, and it's interesting because I saw godly people surround me at that time. So, you know, I think I can share this on this type of a show. I think that sure. there's, I, I think the Lord is involved in, in this and, and he helped bring me to this, um, medical practice. And I, I hope and pray that I've been helpful and, and beneficial to a lot of people over the years because of, we can get back to that patient relationship, um, with them that this model engenders. Well, we're so thankful that God led you down this path of purpose because certainly your compassion to care for people over, as Pastor Jay said, yeah. payment is truly paying off in all of your patients' lives and those who hopefully come to you. Thank you for being with us Thank today, you. Dr. Chad. My pleasure. It's now time for another edition of Spirit Walk as Tom takes us through the book of Acts. Let's take a look. One of the things that I love about the gospel is the ordinariness of it, okay? We are regular people, each one of us, just regular people serving the Lord, going about our business, walking with Jesus, walking with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Spirit Walk is all about, that we are going out into that world and we never know exactly what God wants to do when we go out, right? Well, let's. Let's read about two of uh, the disciples, the apostles that went out just doing their ordinary stuff. They were going to the temple 
to pray. That's an ordinary thing that we should do every day, right? Go and pray, have our time of prayer. And they're just walking on their way. And we'll see what happens to them. It's Peter and John. And it says this in Acts chapter three, it says, but Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. See, somebody was asking him for money. There was somebody begging there. Have you ever walked past someone? I have a hard time walking past people. I usually keep like little gift cards or something to give them. So, you know, so we can do, do at least something to say that, hey, we see you there, God loves you, and, and maybe even pray for them. But Peter and John were going, and uh, Peter says, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Now, this fellow was not expecting that. He was not expecting to see that. He was not expecting to hear that, okay? But we talked uh, a few times ago about the power of the Holy Spirit and how God wants to bring that power to us. Then let, let, me, let me tell you what Peter did next. It says, and seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were strengthened. And with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he went all around walking, leaping, praising God. Again, let me just dwell on this for a moment that these were fishermen. Peter and John were fishermen. They were not trained theologians. Maybe you feel like, hey, I'm a steel worker, like the guys behind me that are working at that plant. Or maybe you work in a store, maybe you work in Walmart, maybe you work uh, anywhere. You're doing a regular job, so all, we, all of us are. But by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're able to go and do something extraordinary. I remember one time a, fr uh, a neighbor of mine, he said, it was an older man, he said, hey, I'm having problems with my, uh, my knees. And I said, hey, why don't we pray for you? My wife was there and he was just talking to us over the fence and we prayed for him, prayed for his knees. Then we went off, off for a couple hours. We came back later, he was up on a ladder. He's like, he yells at me, hey Tom, my, my knee feels great. Well, it's a wonderful thing. God's got power for you and I to do the job that he's called us to do. We are ordinary people, but empowered by an extraordinary God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. So your day, who's God gonna bring your way? I hope you've been having a great day so far. There's still more to it. Who's God gonna call, have call you? Or who are you gonna run into that you haven't seen for years? Or is there someone that you don't know at all that you may run into and, and you may have the opportunity to introduce them to the power of the Holy Spirit and better than that, to introduce them to Jesus Christ, their savior, the one that loves them more than anyone. You have that opportunity. You are the one that God has empowered by the Holy Spirit to walk with his spirit that you might see miracles happen and see people come to, to know Jesus. Now you may say, Tom, that's never gonna happen to me. I'm never gonna see somebody stand up that's lame. You don't know that, okay? God visits us at different times in different ways and with different power. But right now I know this, that he's called you to share his love. So go out, maybe it's today, maybe it's tomorrow. Ask the Lord, say, give me an opportunity, Lord, to go out and share your love with someone out there. And he'll do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Just like Tom said, you and I are ordinary people, but we are fueled by an extraordinary God, his Holy Spirit within us, letting us bring heaven to earth, his kingdom to come. What do you have to say to that, Pastor Jay? Well, I think it's awesome. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as yeah. I have given I thee in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. You know, he had, just like Dr. Chad had, you know, that scripture was all about the people. Yeah, that's you know, that's true. really what it was that's about. True. It wasn't about just making money. Making money comes along with it, yep. but that wasn't the primary focus. It was the secondary focus. And I think Come that's on. what's so awesome about what Dr. Chad uh, yes. did and what he's yes. doing. And listen, that's what it's all about. And this, this show today, we're really focusing on how to take care of those that are wounded and putting the wounds and the people before anything else. And if you're familiar with our Cornerstone family, which many of you are, you know about Amanda Brocker. She definitely loves people. People are the most important thing to her, but nobody's more important than her son. And the battle of addiction that nearly cost him his life. Stay tuned. This is Andrew's story coming up right now. So growing up, I was in a Christian household. 
surrounded by the love of God in church, in Royal Rangers, and in Christian schools. When I was six years old, me and my family moved out to Tulsa, Oklahoma, so my dad could go to ministry school to get a master's degree in theology. So our whole family was out there. We were a part of Victory Christian Church, and my roots were founded in God's Word growing up. I had a relationship with God, and we ended up moving back to Pittsburgh when I was 11 years old. And from there, our family moved once, and we would continue to move, and that was pretty hard on me. It, it was hard to leave Oklahoma. I had a lot of friends there. But eventually I adjusted and started going to new schools. I went to my first public school in eighth grade and was introduced to a lot of different things that challenged my faith that I had growing up. And my faith fell apart. It did not last. And I started trying things of the world like drugs, sex. I wanted to be the center of attention. I had a lot of pride and arrogance and a rebellious spirit within me. And that led me down a very destructive path that I could not seem to get off of once I was on it. And it's by the grace of God I'm here today sharing this story with you. And when I was 18 years old, I had a drug overdose and that was in a Starbucks bathroom downtown in Market Square, Pittsburgh. That day I used heroin and cocaine. Um, after I used, I could hardly breathe, so I had to lay on my back. And in that moment, I looked to Jesus because I was taught about Jesus growing up, which I'm so thankful for. I knew who to look to in a challenging moment. And from head to toe, the Holy Spirit came over me when I was on the ground. And He was way stronger than the drugs were that were strong enough to kill me. And I was at peace in that moment knowing I was in God's hands and everything went black. My younger brother at the time was 12 years old and he was praying for me in our living room in Export, Pennsylvania. God spoke to him and said, your brother's in a Starbucks bathroom. You need to call your dad and tell him. My dad was able to find me in that bathroom. It was like a needle in a haystack in Pittsburgh to find one person. And they called an ambulance, hit me with Narcan. And I remember when I saw my feet, I knew God saved me. I knew God loved me. And I knew he was real. And that changed my life forever. After that, it was a process of me getting to know God. I started to read my word day by day, a little more and a little more. I utilized a form of medicated assisted treatment, which was medical marijuana for a 10 month period, which was a big step down from the harder drugs I got into. And from that point on, I was moving forward, growing in a relationship with God. And I knew that that was not my end all be all, but God wanted me to use my testimony for his glory to help people that were struggling in addiction and facing similar challenges that I faced. So I've been working for Recovery Centers of America since March of 2022, almost two and a half years, getting to share my testimony with people there at different churches and small groups. So God is using me in a mighty way to bring people back to Him, the lost, the hurting, the broken, the ones that have lost their way and fell into the trap of addiction. When someone opens themselves up to drugs, they're allowing the enemy to get a foothold in their life and to wreak a lot of havoc. So drug addiction definitely destroyed relationships with friends, family. My relationship with God was also really torn up. And spiritual warfare and addiction, you see when you give the enemy a foothold in your life like that, he, addiction is him getting his claws in you and he does not let go easily because Satan wants to bring you down. He would love for you to die due to alcoholism or drug abuse, but God has a different plan for your life 
and He wants to save you and restore you. God's Word, the Bible says God's Word renews our mind as we read it. So it is a process of renewal, and I'm still in that process. God is still changing wrong behavior patterns, wrong ways of thinking through God's Word. So it has the power to transform someone, and I receive, I read it by faith and receive it, and that has helped me. I would say look to God if you know someone that is struggling with addiction, maybe it's a family member or a close friend, maybe it's yourself, to trust in the Lord, to cling to His Word, to hold on to it for dear life, because He's who brought me through my darkest of times, my rough patches, and He still does. So God is able to move mountains, but we need to have faith and put our trust, faith, and hope in Jesus. Well, listen, Amanda, you don't need any introduction. Everybody knows you. You are a regular here on Cornerstone. I remember the stories of us being in the old prayer room and praying for your son and just everything that you had walked through during that time. I remember encouraging you while you were encouraging others. But this is the first time you've seen the actual produced mm -hmm. segment. Not as a producer, not as a host, not as a prayer partner, as a mom. What did it feel like watching that? Uh, a flood of emotions and just the miracle that God has done because that was our life for many days and you know on my way to work even sometimes finding pot in the house and leaving my husband to have to like deal with it like I had to get here and the, the lights were going to come on and I was it was real life then program we had and uh those moments of how I just would surrender to God and say, I don't have anything to give. But he had something to pour out of this broken vessel. And nobody knew you were going through this stuff. No. That's right. And there were moments where I was able, now the people here I worked with, I mean, this was a daily walk. They yeah. saw, they yeah. saw, you know, and I, I will say, you know, if I could give a, some just information that really helped our family because it, it, it plagued all of us. Yeah. You know, you think your home is your sanctuary, but then it became a battleground for me, like the warfare and you want to decree and declare a thing and stand on the word, but you are not seeing anything of what you're saying happening. Yeah. And what do you do in those moments? Well, I became very frustrated and, uh, we had to learn through counseling that was actually court ordered to our family. I can't say enough about healthy counseling for the family, Very but important. we learned about um, triangular relationships. See him as uh, an addict, they become very manipulative, very divisive. And this is all the enemy. Like you're giving the enemy full reign in your life and you do this whether you want to or not when you yeah. enter that lifestyle. But he would separate my husband and I. So a triangular relationship. Yep. And the counselor told us, uh -uh, you two got to get on the same page because yeah. he would know he would never approach us together. He would go to one and then he would go to the other and kind of play off words. And so it was constantly dividing my husband and I. So we had to come into unity with each other and never give him a response without talking to the other. Yeah. So we learned that. And then another thing, you know, when you have, we have four children, we just didn't have one child. Yes. I have four children and they're all amazing, but our focus went on the one, the rebel one. And that is another area where in households it can really stress the family, the children, because of all of our focus being on him, the others felt neglected. And yeah. so it was like the Lord had to bring order in, and, you know, and it was almost like sometimes they would act out too because that was what got the intention. So we have mm -hmm. to go back and like reel in, okay, and not parent from a place of emotions because I was a hot mess. And the Lord told me because I got so angry with him and I could not, we poured into him like and it wasn't that we were perfect parents. I'm not gonna say that, but I didn't allow him in atmospheres like that 
of yeah. what he was entertaining. And it's like, why are you choosing this? Yeah. And I wanted to fix him and I became very frustrated. And God said, I need you to read the book of Hosea. Like he just was real to me and helped me. And I had to learn that I'm Gomer too because oh, I had developed the so attitude good. kind of like yeah. in the, the New Testament, this story, the prodigal son, yes. that's really yeah. about the heart of the father. I had a little bit of the older brother's arrogance, like, oh, mm. like I was angry, like well, you chose to do this. Yes. Why are you doing this to, to not just yourself, but to all of us, why? And God in his own gentle way gave me a, a little butt whooping, you know, and it's like Amanda, he took me to First Peter. I mean, I, I'm just going to read it to you because I, I didn't see that my fix it. See, I was going to fix him. I, yeah. I was decreeing the word. I'm, I'm like yes. a microwave miracle. God, just yes. do this. And he's like, yeah, this is a little more like a crock pot. So <laughs> Take your time. yes, First Peter 5, and it's the second part of that verse through verse seven, it says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. And the Lord just gently showed me how all my fix it behaviors was pride. Wow. I was not trusting him that he could fix my kid. Wow. I was trying to do it. I'm like, I know the word, like, yes, we know the word, but if I could say that to any parents that are out there walking through this, or you have relatives that are walking through this, that you would please sit with Jesus and really love, love the person, just as the doctor was saying earlier yes, on the program, yes. this is what we need. I know we desire the miracle. We want it to happen right away. And Pastor Jay, in that season, I can remember we were doing prayer partner trainings and, and part of it was for those that we call, you know, they're dealing with addiction in their household and to tell them, don't rob the individual of their process. Gotta They've got to go through it. Right. And when Andrew tells you about the word of God, see, I learned I had to be quiet. I had to wait till he asked a question. Then I could share it with him. Yeah. But I had to wait and wait on the Lord. But Andrew would literally, I called it the Andrew murmur because every morning of the last six years of that boy's life, he has gotten up and read the word over himself and I could hear it through the walls of our home. <laughs> that is where the healing came. When he dug into the word of God for himself and it is a beautiful healing. It's and amazing. He's at it is. ORU. He's at ORU. He's Love it. thriving. He is head up Come over on. the uh, mission that's going to the Tulsa Boys Home, reaching out Let's to kids go. that were just like himself. Wow, that's, that's awesome. awesome. Well, you know what? Your faithfulness here at Cornerstone has been outstanding, and we're yes. so glad to have walked with you through that process and to see the goodness of the Lord in Thank your you life. Me. And now it's a testimony to so many other people. Yes. So. God bless you today. We hope that you are encouraging. If you're dealing with a child or a family member in addiction, realize that the best is yet to come for them. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.